I think most of us can agree that chipping is not an easy technique. It takes practice, experience, and patience to make it look in scale and interesting. Badly painted chips can destroy an entire model that you spend months building and painting, so one would think it's best to just avoid chipping rather than try and learn the do's and don'ts. In this video I'll share a few tips which I learned over the years and then show you 4 easy techniques that I guarantee will make you a better... chipper? What is up mates? What's happening? Let's start with some quick explaining where I'll be using a combination of videos and photos from my older builds to better get the point across. I'll be using these side screens from an old out of the box model, which I'm never gonna finish because I built myself a slightly better one. They already have filters, oil dots and washes applied, which makes them perfect for this demonstration. And before we get to those 4 totally legit insane life hack techniques that will turn you into another Adam Wilder, let me talk about some basic, but very important, but basic stuff. Basic stuff number 1. Decide when to apply chipping. Don't turn your weathering into a mess. Each technique has its own place in terms of when it should be used. Filters, for example, are usually the first technique we use when we're done with the base code and markings. There are two common approaches to chipping. Right after you're done with your paint job, aka before filters, washes, oils and everything else. And second, after filters, washes and oils. And then followed up with dust, mud and stuff like that. I personally use the latter approach and you'll see that in this video as well. But of course, there were a few cases when I painted them before every other technique. The main difference between those two is that when you apply chips first, they get toned down a bit more, while if you apply them after washes and oils, they'll have more pop so to speak. Basic tip number two, don't use hairspray as a crutch. Painting chips by hand is a time consuming process. It's also not the easiest technique out there. Many modelers therefore use hairspray or chipping fluid technique as a quick solution to get lots of natural looking chips with minimum effort and time. The problem is that hairspray chipping, if you want really good results, is equally if not even more difficult than the traditional brush painted approach. Things like how many layers of chipping fluid should you apply, how far your airbrush should be while airbrushing, how thick the paint layer needs to be, what thinner to use, how long before you can start peeling the paint, and many more variables enter the game. The most difficult part of hairspray chipping is how unpredictable it can be. Not to mention if you decide to go this way, you can say goodbye to techniques like pre-shading, post-shading, color modulation, zenithal light, distressing or black and white technique. And in most cases it's not even that fast. I spend more than 30 hours on this bulldozer just to get all the chipping done. Stuff Numa Dry. Use correct paints. Brush painted chips are usually done with acrylic brush specific paints in two or three steps. First layer of superficial chips, second layer of dark steel chips, and sometimes third layer of very faint enamel or oil paint rust tones. With the first layer you have to choose or mix an appropriate color that's basically a lighter version of the base coat. Don't use grass green on olive drab or lemon yellow on german dark yellow. There are many modulation sets on the market so if you're unsure just get one of them, paint the model with the mid-tone or just do a complete color modulation if you want and then use the lightest paint for chipping. For darker steel tones, it's best to use dark grey or greyish brown colors. This also depends on the color of the tank. Dark grey chips would probably disappear on a German grey tank, so you'd have to use more brownish tone. Basic number 4. Practice where it's not visible. It will take some time until you get the good grasp of the delicate movements of your hand needed to paint decent chips. Play it safe and practice on hard to see parts of your model like the lower hull or road wheels which usually get covered with mud or dust, or in places like under the turret. So let's now get to those mind blowing techniques. Number 1. Sponge. Sponge is a very clever chipping tool and you can get it either from your kitchen or from packaging boxes. 
All you have to do is get a small or medium sized piece, this depends on how large ground you wanna cover, and make the edges slightly more random by tearing out small chunks. You can then use tweezers as a handle. For the first layer of chips I chose Iraqi sand from Vallejo. Because these paints are usually very thick, a drop or two of tap water is needed to thin them down into a better consistency. Now we can dip the sponge into the paint and here's an important step. You have to remove most of the paint on a piece of paper until it leaves just a trace that looks something like... Wait for it... This. Now we are ready to chip the model. It's best to start chipping around the edges because those are usually the most exposed parts that can easily get worn down. Then you can add some random small flakes across the entire panel. Sponge creates natural looking random patterns and you'll quickly learn how to paint them by brush if you give these techniques a few tries. It also creates lots of fine chips in very short amount of time. Here's what would happen if your sponge was overloaded with paint. Okay, that's still not horrible enough. Yeah, this. And I've seen a few people doing this, so please make sure to unload the paint each time. It'll save you a lot of frustration later. Now you have to thin the paint down a little bit more until you get a consistency like this. Now pick the finest brush you have. Triple zero brushes with longer bristles that can hold more paint are the best for this task. Something like this triple zero from Vallejo. All you need to do now is to connect some of the random flakes. I usually start by outlining the edges. Again. It's good to turn the model around to always get the most comfortable painting position. This way you'll be more relaxed and precise. When you're done outlining you can connect and enlarge some of the random chips in the center of the panel. Now the result looks quite refined and it didn't take that long. Let's now look at another technique. Number 2. Toothpick. Let's say you don't have very good brushes and the best one you have looks like this. And let's assume you are not very patient or your hands are very shaky and the best chipping you can achieve looks like this. Yeah, this happens quite a lot and I hope we can agree it doesn't look ideal. In that case, all you need is a toothpick. Vallejo, Ammo, AK and Life Color paints are flexible, which makes them very easy to remove with toothpicks or any other sharp instrument. This gets easier if your paint job is glossy or semi-glossy. Removing the excess paint like this is... technically chipping, and that's why it creates nice, sharp and uneven shapes. Yes, it will leave quite a messy surface, but that's easy to remove. A big soft brush is great for removing any paint that's flaking off, but it's hard to remove with the toothpick. A smaller brush and some water will remove most of the paint residue. It all looks so much better now, don't you think? It's not excellent, but definitely more presentable than before. Now we'll paint the second layer of steel chips, and this step is the same whether you chose the sponge or toothpick technique. There's just no way around it. You have to do it by brush because you need that extra precision. There are again multiple options on the market, but for this video I again chose Vallejo paints. So I'm gonna mix a dark grey paint using German grey and deck tan, and I'm only using deck tan because I don't have white. I know, don't judge me. The consistency should again be something like this. 
And like I said, you need as much precision as you can get, so I'm gonna use my favorite chipping brush, but I'll also unload a small amount of paint each time before I touch the model. Again, it's best to start by outlining the edges of each panel. Note how I'm often reloading the brush with fresh paint. That's when the brush leaves the screen. And it's because there's not that much of it in its bristles. The point is to fill the inside of the first light layer, but to keep a faint outline. This way the chipping will look three-dimensional and it will also have that pop I talked about in the beginning of this video. When you're done outlining the edges, it's time to fill some of the random flakes in the center. Here you don't need to fill all of them, but it's good to focus at least on the biggest ones, because those would naturally go straight through the paint exposing the metal underneath. The dark color also tones the entire effect down, so when you look at the panel as a whole, the chipping isn't so overwhelming anymore. Let's try to do the same, but with a less quality brush and less skill. Luckily this step is easier, at least in one thing. You already have the first layer laid out, so you don't need to think about random patterns and where to place each chip. All you need to focus on is filling them with the dark grey color. Just try to stay inside each light color chip and you'll be fine. And even if you don't and you make some mistakes, there is again the toothpick. This will obviously affect both layers of paint, so use it just to fix your worst mishaps. As you can see, it's definitely possible to get decent results even if you don't have the experience or patience. Now there's the third step, which again applies to both techniques, aka rust tones. I'm not considering this another life hack technique because it's just one of the steps used to get the final result and the process is the same whether you're a beginner or a pro. Luckily for us, there are many enamel rust products on the market, so just choose whatever brand you prefer, shake the bottle for a while to mix the pigment inside, and you're good to go. I like to apply rust over most of the dark steel chips and usually over the edges as well, because again, those are the most exposed parts. This step is fairly easy, but also requires a lot of patience because you're applying the enamel rust product specifically over each chip, one by one. The amount of rust must be refined, otherwise it will become too overwhelming. When you're done, clean your brush. Get some clean enamel thinner and you can start blending. The point of the blending process is to partially remove the rust tones from the small chips and to feather the edges over the larger ones. Again, it's important to make the effect refined and restricted so the model won't look like an abandoned vehicle. It's basically a sort of filter because it also blends the previous two chipping layers into one natural looking effect. This process is also very easy, but again a bit time consuming, and it also requires some patience. Now with the rust tones done, we can see there's still something missing on this panel when compared to this one. All those small chips that we created with a sponge can be made in another way, which brings me to the next technique. Number 3. Speckling. Put some of that enamel rust product into a palette and get a soft flat brush like this one. Dip it into the paint and using a toothpick you can flick the paint off the brush to create hundreds of fine specks of paint. It's again important to unload the brush on a piece of paper until it produces only very small specks. Try it a few times until you get a good understanding of how this works. Now we can start to carefully flick the paint on the model. The amount of specs also depends on the effect you're after, but generally you shouldn't get carried away with it. You can refine the effect further by removing any oversized specs with a brush and enamel thinner. Now we have lots of dark, rusty microchips all around the surface. But we can also create light chips with this technique. 
Using oil paints. Oils are very thick, so it's important to thin them down with enamel thinner. Then take the same brush as before and get to work. And once again, any large specks are easily removed with small amounts of enamel thinner. Pretty neat, huh? But if you're still not the biggest fan of any of those techniques, but you want to show some wear and tear on your models, there's one more technique that can help you. Number 4. Oil Paints. You can use a combination of rusty and black brown oil paint or an enamel rust effect and black brown oil paint. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that you can use these two tones to simulate worn edges. Start by applying the rust color along the edge. When it's dry to the touch, carefully blend it until you get a nice smooth transition. Now take the black brown and paint the inside of the worn area. And using a completely dry brush blend it again, leaving the first rusty layer as an outline. This technique is a million times easier, but it creates very different effect. If you're shaking your head, let me tell you that I actually used to work with this technique a lot in the past. Take a look at this. 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 And this. That's the same technique. While it doesn't have the pop and sharp look of traditional chipping, it still recreates paint that has been worn away over time and it's also a great option if you just lack the skill and patience to paint thousands of small chips by hand. After all, that's why I used this approach in the past as well. You can obviously mix these techniques with each other and pick ones that you like the most to create interesting effects. I highly recommend painting chips by hand because you'll learn how to work with your brush with extreme precision, you'll become more patient, and all of that will help you become a better modeler in general. I paint chips by hand on 90% of my models, but there are also some subjects that need to be chipped using the hairspray technique or with the combination of both. But those are so few and far between that I haven't used hairspray or chipping fluid to create actual chipping effect in years now. And if you feel put off by these results and think there's too much chipping or rust, just keep in mind how much of it gets toned down by earth tones and when you combine all of those techniques, the result will always be a model that's at least somehow interesting to look at. So I hope you learned something from this video or at least found it interesting to watch. And if I actually helped you in some way, make sure to help me in return by giving this video a like, sharing it with a friend who might find it useful as well, and subscribing if you haven't yet because I have more content like this coming your way. And as a small bonus, I'll try to fix this other panel, so before we get to bloopers, let me just thank you all for watching and I'll see you mates in the next one. And now some bloopers. Techniques that will turn you into another Adam Wall. blah blah blah. Each technique has its own place. Each technique has its own place in terms of when a First light layer of superficial shi ships. <laughs> Play it safe and pla and practice. Practice. Play it safe. Play it safe and. Uh. Sponge is a very clever chipping tool, and you can get it either. Blah. Sponge creates natural looking. <clears throat> Sponge creates natural look. Sponge. Sponge creates natural. Blah. It's good to turn or It's good. Blah. It's good to turn. It's good to turn. It's good. This will obviously affect both layers. Both. Both layers. As you can see, it's definitely possible to get decent result. Decent results. Now there's the third step. Third step. Third step. Third step. The amount. The amount of rust must be refined. Otherwise. Whilst. The amount of rust must be very refined, otherwise, whilst, whilst.